The Mongols say, we don't want to go live in those towns. We're used to living in a, in a yurt like the one above Bryn and Greta over there. If we move up in uh, one of them fancy Chinese cities, we're going to become a city slicker. Right? We're one of them there prettiest city boys. Not from real Texas and Houston, right, Ryan? All right? Country boys, all right? They know how to change a tire and work on their pickup truck and hunt and clean game and cook over an open fire. If you go up in one of them there cities, well, you just get citified, where you think food comes wrapped in plastic at a Harris Teeter. You know that people change your tire called AAA. You can't do any of that stuff anymore. So the Chinese want to maintain their, or the Mongols want to maintain their separation. Some of the Mongols look, yeah, look there, great con. You know, sleeping in a yurt is great, but I had a rock in my back last night. It kind of sucks. And I hear tell they got some medical treatments up in there, and they sleep in nice pillows, and they may have hot and cold running water, and they may actually have food that. Tastes good, all right. General Mao's chicken, all right. It's number seven at Timberline. All right, that's right, good stuff. It's hot and spicy soup. So we want to go live up in there, and slowly but surely, the Mongols will be assimilated into Chinese culture because they're so much more highly advanced. And the big emperor to know during the Mongol dynasty is Kublai Khan, right? who goes all in on expansion. He doesn't meet Marco Polo, but he does talk to the famous Islamic traveler known as Ibn Battuta. Ibn Battuta all right? If you guys are in Mr. Bennett's class and you didn't know that, I was going to tell him because Mr. Bennett loves him some Ibn Battuta. And Kubla conquers everything he can get his hands on except Japan. 1274 and 1281, he launched invasions. Both times they were sunk by hurricanes. The Japanese were believed were sent by a divine emperor, so they call it a day and say, no mas. But as a result, the Mongols will establish trade um, with the cities of Kiev and the Ukraine and the Golden Horde in Russia. And it is the Mongols, like Tamerlane, who was, never mind, it is the Mongols that will help the spread of Islam come far east into Southeast Asia. It has spread far, but now with guys like Tamerlane, and it will push not only into India, Southeast Asia, and out into the Pacific Islands. You guys doing okay? Abigail, make sure the question's easy. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Did they try to convert people to China? They try to convert people to Islam? Yeah, no. No, no, no. Around it. Around the borders. Yeah, around the edges. Yeah. They started off as Chinese Mongols convert to Islam, and on the way back, as they were expanding down to the south, they converted, but not in China. All right. Next one. Ah. It's not called the Great Ming Dynasty for nothing. Ming Dynasty. Parallels in history, 1368 to 1654. The Ming are going to be in power when a lot of stuff goes on. Number one, they're there during the Renaissance. The Ming are there during the Age of Exploration. And the Ming will end during the Great Age of... Absolutism. Thank you. So there are the three things happening historically during the great Ming Dynasty. Ming Dynasty is known as the Pax Romana of China. It is 600 years of unprecedented economic growth in China. This was the place and the time to be in China. In 1368, they overthrow the Mongols. And the Ming are known as the last true dynasty of China. They were all Chinese. They bring in new agricultural techniques, and they convert from growing wheat to growing rice. And while that it doesn't sound like a big deal, rice is hardier, 
It's not as susceptible to disease. And one handful of rice, throw a handful of rice in a pot, and what happens? It expands. So a little bit of rice can feed a lot of people. So as a result of the food surplus, there's a massive population boom that goes on in China at this time. Um, Senshi banks are banks where deposits of silver will be put throughout um, China. Think of said, a Bank of America, it is the Bank of China. This allows merchants like Myanmar to travel in and around China buying and selling goods and services. A national economy never grows, but seven to eight large regional economies grow where goods and services are um, exchanged. It is at this time, yes sir? How is this better than what was developed during the Tang Dynasty, where you um, can exchange things for credit? It, well, you still can, mm -hmm. but now there are more banks. Instead of paper money, we have silver money, which is more durable. Okay. So, yeah, right, so, um, but we'll go back to paper. But it's the same, it's just more extensive. Okay. All right. um, because we're really cool and powerful and big and strong, and we want the world to know how cool of an emperor we are, we're going to build, build a big house. But in China... We can, why build a house and we can build what, Iris? No we can build an entire city. Yeah, Peter the Great, nothing, St. Petersburg. What do you get a load of this? And the Forbidden City is built. It is a city meant to augment the power of the Chinese emperor. And everything is made to make you feel humble and small until you walked into the throne room and saw the emperor and you really felt small. He was the divine emperor. Um, he will send out Zhang or Chang Ho's fleet of 68 ships that will trade from Southeast Asia to India over to Africa. They were very colorful and elaborate, meant to show the power of the Chinese dynasty. And so a tribute system is is that thunder? A tribute system is created where the Chinese would say, do you want to work with us? Do you want to be part of the Chinese economy? If you do, you've got to give tribute, something that you make or do really well. If the emperor really likes it, you belong to China. You are protected by China. You can trade with China. If your product is crappy, then you are done and nobody, nobody cares. Um, China is still seen as one large big family. Remember, individual accomplishments are gauged by the success of the team. So saith um, Confucius. Um, the, and here was the header when you, know, you got the question. The Ming were an absolute empire, but the building of the Forbidden City and Zhang Ho's fleet cost so much money that the great dynasty will eventually go bankrupt. But here is where civil service training reaches its high point. You went to the village, you went to the mid-sized city, and you took the test. One shot, one time deal to work in the large metropolitan area. As China has 11 cities that are over a population of 1 million people at this time. And here, the Ming decided to become isolationist. We are the best civilization there can possibly be, so the rest of you just get out. And there were some foreigners that would come in, you know, sailors trapped on a boat for six, eight months, Portuguese sailors, French sailors, British sailors, that the um, Chinese came up with a Cantonese system where they stayed in the port of Canton. They could get off on an island. But there was a miniature Great Wall of China that barred them from coming onto mainland China. They didn't want them there because they did not behave very well. You guys got about another 10 minutes in you? All right, everybody got this? I know. Is any of this coherent? God, I hope so. All right.
All right. Now we're going to get to the Manchu Dynasty or the Qing Dynasty, 1644 to 1911. These are the guys who are going to screw everything up. Now, <clears throat> Manchu Dynasty will be in place during the heyday of European imperialism. 1644 to 1911, what happens? Well, we have the collapse of um, absolutism, but we get into that period of nationalism and imperialism, where we're going to go out and take you over because of what big world event that happens in 1750. Big, massive thing that happens, changes the world forever. 1750. Armistead Brundage, the fourth of the Virginia Fourth Cavalry. Say that again. Industrialization. The Industrial Revolution. All right, the steam engine. All right, because the steam engine, Europeans are now going to go out and they are literally going to take over virtually the entire globe. Why am I yelling? I don't need to. And I can't. It makes my ears vibrate. Um, so, the British because of the steam engine and because of their um, unit, unity on the British Isles, get a head start in imperialism. Plus, they've got that corporation, that stock company, that replaced, we're no longer trying to make money for the mother country, we're trying to make money for, what's the name of this company? British East India Company, B-E-I-C. <coughs> They begin to carve out spheres of influence. They start, we know, over in India with the Mughal dynasty, and then they go over into China, where the Opium War is going to take place. Well, when England gets there, because of the competitiveness of nationalism and imperialism, everybody else is running to keep up with Great Britain, like Ryan's competitors are keeping up with him in cross-country. I got you, Ryan. Yeah. All right. So, um, other European countries follow. When the British are told they can no longer sell opium to the Chinese citizenry, the opium war breaks out. When England shows off their might and their power, they tell the Chinese, not only are you going to pay to repair the damage to our property, but you're going to give us things. Number one, we want access to your ports. Number two, we want access to your mineral rights. And number three, we get a most favored nation clause. Whatever deal you cut with anybody else, we always get one better. In China, who way back in the Shang Dynasty in Myanmar, always was able to control its economy. They always exported more than they imported for the first time China is not in control of itself. Europeans are dictating what happens. And so people are going to rebel against European intrusion. The Taiping Rebellion will start. All right? Students you know, complaining about European intervention. 20 million people are going to die. In 1906, the um, Chinese Christians, a, a martial arts sect, like kickboxers, called the Boxer Rebellion, begins to rebel against foreign treatment of Chinese workers in factories, and a multinational group of like British, French, Belgian, Japanese, German armies come in and brutally put down the Boxer Rebellion. But the Chinese are slowly becoming unified they went to drive Europeans and the Japanese out of their country. So they make the decision to use the West to control their own destiny. Let's learn Western science and technology. Let's kick out the Europeans, and we will do this stuff for ourselves. Very good. Anybody still conscious? You have any? You got false. You good? All right. Here we go. Chinese Republic, 1912 to 2016, which means we are within two slides of finishing. Hello, we're doing pretty good. 
1911. We know the last emperor is gone, and Sun Yat Sun, the father of Chinese nationalism, is going to be asked to come to power. And he will create the Chinese Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang. And this will carry China through World War I, World War II, and the Cold War to the modern day. After World War I, the European countries were busy trying to fix their mess. The United States was isolationist, and Sun Yat-sen needed help trying to modernize China. So he asks, England doesn't pay him attention. France doesn't. Even the United States doesn't. So China's looking around for a friend, and they saw the one country that never had any, Mother Russia. And Mother Russia says, we'll help you as long as we have a friend. And Sun Yat Sun will say, the Soviet Union is the one true friend of the Chinese Republic. So Sun Yat Sun will send out his right-hand man, Chiang Kai-shek, to go to the Soviet Union to learn about industry and modernization and communism. Supposed to be gone two years. When he comes back like four months later, and Sun Yat is like, you're supposed to be gone two years. And Chang says, look, communism is not all that hard. I got it. Right. And he brings back advisors, mainly military guys, and they say the way to get and keep power is with an army. And it's at this time that a new political party is being um, created the Chinese, the Communist People's Party, building off ideas of Marxism. And while these political parties are, are trying to take root, the Japanese begin to invade. The Japanese had industrialized and they're after raw materials, of which China has a lot of. And Mao Zedong will be the leader of the Communist People's Party. 1925, Sun Yat-sen dies, and Chiang Kai-shek takes over. And this will begin the Chinese Civil War, because for whatever reason, Chiang was afraid of the Japanese. He would not fight them, but he tries to stamp out communists from China. So while Japan is slowly gaining more and more and more ground, Chiang is chasing Mao Zedong on the long march. It's an enormous march of over 6,000 miles where 70,000 people die. In the meantime, Japan gets stronger and stronger and stronger. In 1931, when the Japanese blow up their railroad in Manchuria, Chiang Kai-shek has to call a timeout. And this break in the action gives Mao Zedong the time he needs to consolidate his power. He's grassroots. You will not steal from the people. You will buy things from them. Or you will say please and thank you. Or you will work for the food that you need. And going out amongst the people, Mao Zedong becomes extremely powerful. He gives that great quote, it takes a single spark, a single spark can start a prairie fire. And after the war, while the United States makes the Japanese surrender to Chiang Kai-shek, a civil war kicks, oh, um, excuse me, kickstarts again. And by 1949, Mao Zedong has won. He has defeated Chiang Kai-shek, and he establishes the People's Republic of China. Just like in the fall of the Western Roman Empire, and many of the wealthy people fled, to Constantinople, a lot of the wealthy and educated people moved to Hong Kong or to Taiwan who are British protectorates. And then we're going to get to the Great Leap Forward in the Cultural Revolution in a second. All right, you guys got this? Last slide. Boom, boom, boom. Modern China. Is this the last slide? Oh, God. <laughs> You're going to have to write all It's modern stuff. You guys know it. Um, 1958. Mao will institute um, what he is called the Great Leap Forward. Um, he has the Great Cultural Revolution where he wanted to stamp out everything possible 
that made it look like there were different social classes. And the great leap forward is his idea where he wants people to be independent. So he brings over Soviet advisors and they school him on what we are talking about today, Stalin's five-year plans. And what's going to happen is there's going to be giant communes. Each is going to have its own school, its own factory, its own little collection of huts, and they are going to be responsible for this territory. And each area is given a quota of food they're going to grow and things they need to build like roads, bridges, things of that nature. So you've got to build infrastructure and you've got to grow food. Well, the problem is nobody knew how to do this stuff. So Miles says it as if people are going to know what to do, and it's a massive disaster where about 30 million people are going to starve to death. So it's a horrible idea. To rebound from that, Mao Zedong comes up with the great cultural revolution. We are going to exterminate all non-communist practices. And young people join a thing known as the Red Guards. Think of the Emperor's bodyguards in Star Wars. And they begin to attack anything that wasn't communist. Teachers, professors, business managers, even communists who weren't seen as communist enough are attacked, beaten up, and killed. When it's done, thousands are homeless, thousands are jobless, businesses are closed, and it looks like China is on the verge of another civil war because things are just absolutely miserable. Just about as bad as they were for the French before the French Revolution. You guys still copying all this down? A couple of people are. How many? Seven people. Tomorrow we'll stop shorter. Is that cool? Is this helping? I'm looking at like Blaine's bear. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. China? Is that a country? So, in Julia? All right. We got this. All right. Was the Red Yes, young people, students, young people. You guys would form the Red Guards and try and kill me. Strike today, all week. Give me another minute, we'll move on, and I can put this one back up at the end. Boy. Sounds like it's really raining. Nothing was at the bar. Oops. All right. In a second, I'll put this back up. There's only one more. Um, in the middle of this, we get the Cold War. And here's where China begins to break away from the Soviet Union. They said, you know what, some of that commie stuff is great, but we need it to fit China. We need to make it fit us. And Mao will give more power to the peasant class. Something that Lenin and Stalin, Lenin wanted to do, but remember Bob? Bob knew how to put the lug nuts on, but what did Bob not know how to do? He had to run the factory. He had no clue. Mao gives much more power to the um, peasants. And China and the Soviet Union also begin to compete for attention from third world countries. Each wanted to export its own certain brand of communism. Chinese communism and Russian um, communism. Well, Mao is going to die in 1976. He's finally dead. And he's replaced by a guy named Deng Xiaoping. It's the best I, I call him Dang. And, and Dang is a guy who owned some interest in private businesses. He was a complete and total communist. And he goes, look, we got to simplify this thing. We're going to go for the four modernizations, four things we're going to upgrade in China to get us on a world level. Number one is agriculture. We've got to grow some food. 
Number two, we got to get some Chinese manufacturing industry to come in this thing. Number three, we got to get Lenovo cranked up. We got to get some science and technology. I think they're Chinese. Not they are now. It's made in Chinese. And so we can protect ourselves and show the rest of the world who we are, we got to have a strong defense. Agriculture, industry, science, technology, and the military. Excuse me. Um, once governmental quotas were met, incentive here, Brundage, once our quotas are met, you can keep making a surplus and sell it for a profit. Now the people have an interest and an incentive to actually work. I'm actually going to work. I'm just going to stand around and stare. Um, as a result of this, China's population gets so big, in 1979, they passed the one child law where each family was only allowed one child. Because of Chinese paternalism, boys were highly sought after. There was a lot of abortion or girls were given up for um, adoption. This had, the pendulum has swung the other way. China has a declining population and all the guys are saying, well, we want to get married, but there are no, there are no girls. So girls can be highly selective when marrying in China because they are a, um, a, um, they're much in demand. I don't know if we can say that, but it's the best way, it's the best way I can explain it right now. Um, by 1980s, the standard of living had improved. China is slowly catching up. The modernizations are working. And in the 1980s, something crazy happens. China begins to entice and market China's wonders to Western tourists. The Great Wall. President Clinton goes into the Forbidden City, the Terracotta Warriors, all right, the massive city of Shanghai. And so Western tourism comes. And so Chinese students will begin going abroad, and when they go to the West, they come back with these crazy ideas like democracy and freedom. And they start touting it. So in 1989, 100,000 students go to Tiananmen Square behind Brundage and Robert, and they begin to protest. They want a better life. Dang responds, as we always do when we're a dictator, we send in the army to brutally put down and suppress the protests. But afterwards, with the attention put on him, Dang is forced to make some concessions, and China is rewarded with the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Some of you may have played it on your Wii's back when they were big, and that's awesome. Um, China has to deal with human rights issues. A lot of poets, a lot of actors, human rights activists have been working hard um, in China, trying to find out what really goes on in there. And slowly but surely, China is becoming more and more and more capitalistic. And that is China. Any questions? As fast as I can do it, and I can't breathe. Does anybody need an old slide put back up? Will? Oh, uh, you said thanks. Oh, you're very welcome. You guys have a safe trip home. If you need to wait in here until mom or dad comes, feel free. You need to use my phone. You know, all of you guys have phones. Knock yourselves out. And I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow will be a little shorter. Simply because I don't know what shape I'll be in. So, just being honest. What? Where? What is tomorrow? Tomorrow will be um, India and Japan. Like India and Hinduism and Buddhism. May our good Google Prophet Mohammed Don't use that language. Yet.